Greetings and welcome everyone to today's On With Life webinar on functional electrical stimulation and stroke recovery, practical applications and creative interventions. My name is Dave Clark, I'll be your host today. This is the seventh webinar in our series of stroke rehabilitation webinars. If you missed one of the earlier webinars, all of them are available on the On With Life website. There's no cost to view any of the webinars, and each webinar is good for one contact hour of continuing education credit. After you view the webinar, just complete the evaluation form, and you'll receive your certificate. All right, well, let's get started with today's presentation on functional electrical stimulation and stroke recovery. And let's begin by meeting our presenters. Samantha Williams is an occupational therapist at On With Life. She's worked in the area of neurological rehabilitation for the past eight years and has been with On With Life for the past two years. Sam received her master's degree in occupational therapy from St. Ambrose University, and she's a certified brain injury specialist and is currently working toward obtaining her assistive technology professional certificate. Nicole Weidman is a physical therapy assistant at On With Life. She's worked in the field of brain injury rehabilitation for 13 years, and she resides on On With Life's safety committee, rehab 16 committee, and continuous quality improvement committee. Nicole maintains the On With Life CBIS certification, and she holds an associate degree in physical therapy, a BS in exercise and sports science, and a master's in healthcare administration. We'll be hearing from Samantha a little later on, but first up today is Nicole. So Nicole, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to this educational webinar pertaining to the use of functional electrical stimulation for stroke recovery. This is a one of a 12-part series of webinars that is being offered by On With Life focusing on stroke recovery. I am Nicole Weidman and later on we'll be hearing from my co-presenter Sam Williams. As Dave mentioned, we are therapists at On With Life, which is an organization providing brain injury rehabilitation services. On With Life is located near Des Moines, Iowa. We have programs of inpatient, outpatient, neurological rehabilitation services, as well as community services, and a transitional group home, along with a long-term program that's actually located over by the Omaha area. At this time, we feel like we should formally disclose that neither Sam or I have any financial interest or arrangements with the entities that, are, that produce these healthcare equipment that we will be discussing throughout this webinar today. Throughout this webinar, we hope that we are able to achieve these um, objectives regarding electrical stimulation. Just a general overview of eSTEM, identifying various applications uh, for use in functional recovery interventions, and then identifying three creative interventions using eSTEM for neuromuscular reeducation for both the upper extremity as well as for the lower extremity. So what is electrical stimulation? Electrical stimulation, or eSTEM as most of us in the rehab world know it, is a technique that's been utilized in the rehabilitation setting. It is not a new um, technique, but we're hoping to show some ways that are creative that perhaps you haven't thought of before. eSTEM uh, uses electrical impulses to trigger muscle activity in a targeted muscle group. This response, uh, can be either a gross motor response to elicit a muscle contraction, also known as NMES, or it can be a sensory response used to in increase body awareness as well as pain management. Uh, everyone in the rehab world knows this as TENS, transcutaneous electrical stimulation. When you're using eSTEM uh, to elicit a target response in collaboration with a functional activity, this is referred to as the functional eSTEM or FES, as you'll see it abbreviated. So, why would you use eSTEM for stroke rehabilitation? Um, as we know, stroke is a, a very common brain injury, which typically results in hemiparesis or weakness of one side of the body. Um, cognitive deficits, balance difficulties, speech impairments, and so on. FES is a well-researched rehabilitation intervention for stroke recovery. 
there is a plethora of scientifically based evidence regarding its uses. It can be used for functional retraining of a hemiparetic limb, both upper and lower extremities. There's also very limited research regarding the use of e-stem for dysphagia management when it is performed by a trained as speech language pathologist. At this point in time though, the research does indicate that more research is needed for use in dysphagia management. Overall, um, e-stem is a uh, easy and it's relatively easy to use I and mean, it's got a quick setup time once you have your parameters established and overall it is generally uh, tolerated by most patients. Uh, while this webinar focuses on use of e-stem during functional activities and ADLs, e-stem can also be used uh, for pain management subluxation interventions, and in some cases, uh, spasticity management. As with any um, intervention, um, there's usually some sort of precautions, contraindications uh, to consider. Uh, in this case, e-STEM, since you are dealing with electrical impulses, um, has several of those, and just to touch on those briefly, um, you want to make sure the person doesn't have any sort of pacemakers or simulators. Um, you don't want to put the, Im the uh, electrodes over a metal implant. If they have any active bleeding or wounds, you would not want to avoid using e-stim over those areas. Um, obviously, pregnancy is usually some sort of a precaution or contraindication for any intervention. And of course, you would want to obtain an order from your doctor before you proceed with e-STEM activities. So today throughout the webinar, we will be discussing um, some creative interventions with use of e-STEM. Um, we're going to talk about uh, functional electrical stimulation in, with use of task-oriented training, as well as rhythmic cycling, which has some interesting research behind it. We're also going to discuss um, somatosensory um, training and specifically in regards to mirror therapy and then in use of gait activities. There are a variety of devices out there that utilize e-STEM. Uh, for functional e-STEM, what we found is best is a portable e-STEM device, which is optimal for convenience to both uh, the, the patient um, or, and the therapist. TENS units are practical for everyday use in the clinic or generally relatively inexpensive. Then you can work your way up to more complex devices, including um, the functional electrical stimulation bike, which is pictured there up in the right hand side of the screen. Um, it also contains the SAGE unit, which can be disconnected from the bike itself and used as a portable FES device. Uh, the FES bike shown in this uh, picture is created by Rehab Technologies, RTI. Um, it's the one we have here at On With Life, but I know there are other um, FES bikes out there. Um, this particular device provides e-stem to both the upper and lower extremity, but not simultaneously. You can only use the upper extremity e-stem or the lower extremity e-stem. It, this FES bike does provide a nice visual feedback um, to the person served on the computer screen. They can see themselves pedaling down the road and it provides feedback whether they're drifting one way or the other because maybe one extremity is doing more work than the other. And it'll show the power output that the affected limb that's being triggered is actually participating in. And as I mentioned, it has the SAGE unit that disconnects, that's the screen looking thing. Um, with the electrode um, channels. Um, it can be disconnected and used portably. Um, it has several pre-programmed functional tasks which um, come in quite handy for targeting specific interventions. Um, then another company that makes e-STEM devices is the Bioness company. They make units that are portable for both the upper extremity and lower extremity. 
um, the one that we have here at On With Life that we utilize occasionally is the lower extremity, the L300. It's a peroneal nerve stimulator um, for dorsiflexor assist. Um, they also have pictured there on the left-hand side of the screen is the upper extremity one, but we do not have access to that one here at On With Life. If you are interested in any of those products, uh, you can, of course, check out their website. I'm sure they will list all the options available. Um, at this point in time, I will turn it over to Sam to discuss uh, parameters of eSTEM. Thanks, Nicole. Okay, so before we get um, started too much um, into the parameters of FES, I wanted to one, just apologize for this big, busy slide, but I wanted to get everything in one place so you could easily take this slide back to the clinic with you or put it in a binder, um, have easy access for when the next time you do pull out eSTEM, you can use this as a reference of where to start with your, um, your units um, and your parameters. So the other thing to remember when we're talking about parameters is that the ultimate goal is that we're trying to increase the, the most comfort and the best outcome for our patients. Um, this is just a guide for our parameters. You don't want to use this as it's set in stone. Um, use, adjust your parameters, you know, start here and then adjust those parameters to whatever is most comfortable and in increasing the, that output for your patients. So I'm going to try to talk really briefly about um, all of these parameters, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about each one because I think it's a good refresher to remind us exactly what each one is and what it does um, to help you better understand how to make those adjustments when, in your clinic. Um, so we're going to talk the first one up there at the top is frequency. We have the recommended frequency between 10 and 50 hertz. Um, as you increase that frequency to that a higher number, more of those fast twitch muscle fibers um, are recruited and activate, activated, which um, will show an increase in that muscle contraction. But why that can be trouble sometimes is then it, um, the muscle fatigues quicker. So when you have a weak muscle or you're stimming a muscle that's like a trace or two out of five muscle grade, you want to stick to those lower frequencies to allow for that um, muscle to improve its endurance without um, tiring it out really quickly at the start of your session because again we're trying to um, make our the best output for the for the patients and the, get the most repetitions in a session so somewhere between 10 and 50 hertz for that frequency the next one down we're going to talk about pulse duration or some people say pulse width the pulse duration by definition is the time span that's in between a single electrical pulse um, so the longer a pulse is on, um, the longer it's contracting that muscle. And this is what you would use um, to cause a paretic muscle to contract. A longer pulse duration would um, for your weaker muscles. Your ramp times, the ramp up, ramp down. And a ramping, ramping time is the gradual increase of your current. Um, you want to gradually increase that that current to mimic the functional movement of how the muscles are normally recruited gradually increasing that current allows for a gradual excitation of the nerve fire fibers and a chance for the person to actually try to activate the muscles themselves so if you had a really quick ramp time that's only one or two seconds um, the muscle is just going to contract and turn on and that person that you're doing the east end with isn't going to have a, a enough time to try to activate that muscle themselves. So for example, when I see this quite a bit um, and when I'm using it is in wrist flexion extension activities, um, as you have that stem on the wrist extensor, so you can have a slower ramp time to allow that person to try to activate their wrist extensors along with the, um, along with the ramp time that you have set up. Next one down, we're talking about current type. We're going to talk about symmetrical versus asymmetrical currents. Devices usually have two channels that are um, set for two sets of electrodes that can either be set up to the symmetrical or an asymmetrical alternating pulses. A symmetrical channel will cause the muscle groups to contract all at the same time, 
for example, I use a symmetrical channel the most when I'm trying to um, do a weight bearing exercise with a patient or uh, a pushing exercise with a patient. So I'll set in a symmetrical channel um, on the triceps and the wrist extensors and get them weight bearing at the edge of the mat or put it on the biceps and the wrist flexors when you're doing a hand to mouth activity. So those muscles are firing at the same time. Um, that you want to do that activity. So just think about the activity that you're doing and what muscle groups you're trying to target. And if you have two muscle groups that would be turning on at the same time, you can turn those onto a symmetrical channel. Um, now, while I use a symmetrical channel a lot, I also feel like that asymmetrical channel is really beneficial. Um, this is gonna turn those muscles on in an alternating pattern. So when I use this a lot, it would be, um, wrist extension followed by wrist flexion for a glass grasp and release activity. Um, or if you're working with your PTs and you're working on gait, you could stimulate the dorsiflexors followed then by the plantar flexors. That alternating channel gives you um, the flexibility to stim two different um, muscle groups um, and work on turning one off, turning the other on um, while you're doing that functional activity. Okay, so working our way down, we're on the duty cycle, and the duty cycle here is um, mimicking the functional movement that you want retrained. So what I usually try to do is time these activities to a functional activity, see how they do it on their non-affected side, and then try to time it, um, set your on-off period to be similar to that functional activity that they just did on their unaffected side. Um, you're going to want to increase it if the spasticity is present and definitely increase that time if um, the muscle is much weaker on the affected side than it is on the unaffected side. So just use your judgment here, but try to think about how long would it take them to do the functional activity and then use that as a guide to setting those on off times. Um, the other thing that I like to do when considering duty cycle is um, plug in a trigger if your machine um, has that capability. This is a um, it's like a switch or a trigger switch and I've seen foot switches and I've seen handheld switches. You plug it into your machine and then as the patient is attempting to perform that activity, you, you or the patient then can push that trigger button and the e-stim will kick on at the same time that patient is volitionally trying to do that activity. So it just kind of helps with that motor relearning um, and you're not just sitting there waiting for an on, off, on, off cycle. Um, that's something we'll talk about again later in the presentation as the use of those triggers. The next one down we're talking about amplitude or intensity. So when you're working on those um, units and you're pushing those up and down arrows, um, this is what we're talking about here. And you just want to do what's needed for success. What's necessary to elicit that muscle contraction for your activity and for the patient to do the activity, not necessarily trying to get a five out of five muscle grade um, with the amount of intensity that you have. And then the other thing to remember with amplitude is intense and intensity is that um, even in the session, as someone can um, adjust themselves to the level that you have. So in the middle of a session, it's always good to, to stop and see and adjust that intensity if you need to, to see if they've accommodated to the strength that you have it set to. Some other ways to, um, we're going to talk on these next couple of slides about how to increase the, um, the output or the success that you're having in a session when you're using e -STEM. So the first part we're going to talk about is just the use of the electrodes and the person's skin. So you want to make sure that the skin is clean, hydrated, warm. Um, you can wash and dry with soap and water prior to setting it up. Sometimes a, a warm hot pack on that affected arm that you're going to stimulate or doing a light warm up exercise just to increase that blood flow to the area helps um, the output of that e-stim. You can use electro gel, and in some cases, you may have to actually shave the hair um, on the limb before using the stem to get that best, best results. Um, I found that wiping down the electrodes after each use with water is really helpful to um, increase in the life 
lifespan of your electrodes just to get the dead skin and hair and things that might come off of those electrodes when you pull them off and then seal them in a bag um, and tight it, tighten it up and squeeze that air out to minimize the air exposure to keep them from drying out when you're saving them. This is a nice slide from a um, from an article by Martin et al. Um, we're just going to read across the top here. So on the left, you're looking at the goal. So if the person is um, saying that they're uncomfortable with the e stem, or you're noticing that electrical bleeding, where the um, you're getting results from other muscle groups that you're not trying to stim, but they're tr they're turning on anyways, or the muscle is fatiguing really quickly. These are some ways that you can adjust your settings with those um, e stem units to um, better increase your success in the session. So you, um, what you'd want to do with the frequency, pulse width, the intensity, are you going to want to increase or decrease it? This is just a nice slide again to kind of keep in your back pocket when you take this presentation, hopefully back to your clinics and are working on using eSTEM with your patients, um, how, to, how to best increase the success in your session. Okay, so as Nicole mentioned earlier, we're still talking about FES. And this is the first creative intervention we're going to touch on quite a bit um, for our presentation today. So we're going to talk about how we use FES and eSTEM in task-oriented training. Um, task-oriented training is when you're, what we, the official definition is movement in conjunction with a functional activity that the person has interest in. Um, this is what hopefully we're all doing in our clinics um, every day. This just gives it an official definition. And Birkenmeyer, in their article, actually went and um, did some research on how many reps do you think is um, reasonable to be able to get in a session in an inpatient environment. And what they found is that we should be able to target 300 reps in an hour. Um, that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. So how we can use eSTEM then is to increase that rep amount. Um, so if you're working on task-oriented training and their arm just isn't strong enough to do these tasks or um, it's weak, it gets fatigued, you could try um, using eSTEM to get the best, to get more reps and um, functional movement out of that arm. So for the upper extremity or lower extremity, um, we're gonna be talking about um, four key movements that you wanna, you wanna target when you're doing task-oriented training. So one, rep or one activity should include grasping, reaching, moving and manipulating the object, and then releasing. Um, that's again from that Birkenmeyer article. So one rep would count for all, including all four of those tasks. Um, and then for lower extremity movements, this is, wasn't included in the Birkenmeyer article, but um, this is what we use a lot in our clinic here when we're doing task-oriented training is movements that include trunk flexion, knee extension, hip extension, and some eccentric control of those lower extremity groups. You wanna keep all activities basic in order to be able to achieve that high rep amount. I know what I do is I aim for starting with at least getting 10 reps in a minute for a lower level limb. And when I mean lower level limb and that slide, I'm, I'm talking about a, an arm that's very weak or just getting emerging movement back. Um, I know that I'm moving in the right direction if they're able to get, and the task is just the right challenge, if they're able to get at least 10 reps in a minute. If they're not able to get 10 reps in a minute, I grade my activity, or if they're getting way more than 10 reps in a, in a minute, I grade that activity too, um, to make it harder or keep it there if you're really going for that 300 reps. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about common task-oriented training um, activities for the upper extremity you might see in our clinic. Um, these are all activities that we found that we can easily um, reach um, out of the cabinet and grab these things and set up the activity to get the best results. So we have folding a washcloth, moving a cup, taking grooming items in and out of a bag, moving silverware in and out of a tray, moving stuff from a counter to a shelf, laundry to a, to a basket grasp and release cup, kitchen items. I mean, the, the list is literally endless. 
I would say these are the, the go-to things that I'm usually doing, so that's why I have them on this slide, but task-oriented training does not have to be limited to only the things listed here. It's anything, you know, that the patient that you're working with has interest in and um, includes all of those four things that we talked about on the previous slide, reaching, manipulating an object, grasping, and release. So we're going to watch a couple of videos now of um, some of these items that we have listed here in action. Um, let's see here. Okay. So the first video here, I'm going to go ahead and play it. This gentleman is sitting unsupported at the edge of the mat, so he has pretty good seating balance. And his goal here is to work on finger extension. So you can see I have those pads on his finger extensors. He had really tight um, um, finger flexors and would have a hard time releasing objects on his own. And it actually didn't take a lot of that e-stim to open those hands up. And once his hand got going, it was, it, um, was better. And the other thing I was going to point out here is I have this e-stim placed on an on-off cycle. Um, so he's waiting for the stim to turn on and off. And it was mainly for the video purpose only because clearly we aren't going to be getting 10 reps in one minute based on the pace that he's moving here. Um, so it was really just for our video so I could show what we were working on and just the functional activity that we have working here at the table. You could certainly take this activity into the uh, kitchen at your clinic, um, modify it to be, you know, what's, more, what's important for your patient. But this patient was going to be going home and working in the kitchen and so this made sense for him. We're going to move on to the next video here. So this guy is, um, these are his grooming items. These are his actual grooming items in his grooming bag. So just to make the task even more salient for him. Working on that extension as well, as well as some shoulder control. And I'm just moving the bag and the items around here because it's kind of cool. reaching towards that direction, the other direction without hiking each other. But this is just showing um, just another example of how to do it. Um, and this activity was actually easier for him in standing, so then he didn't have to fight gravity so much. You're going to see me bend at his elbow more and use his butt. So if I could go back and do this activity or again, I would probably move those pads down to his biceps because the, the e stem is, is making that shoulder abduction. I can't help it. And I'm trying to tell him to turn it off, and that's just not working. So, um, but this was just a good way for him to work on and um, opening that hand at the same time. And again, I also wanted just to point out that the I graded this activity to make it easier for him to do it in standing because it was better for his arm there. It was actually harder for him when he was sitting down. So, let's let it play for a second or two longer here and then I'll go on to the next one. Okay? So earlier, Nicole talked about um, how we use the SAGE, which is the computer portion of the FES bike that detaches from the bike, and then you can use it as a portable e-stem unit. So before I even start this video, you can see how many, excuse me, leads and attachments he has on his extremity. So we're actually stimming, I think, one, two, three, or four muscle groups at one time. So this um, like we talked about earlier with our parameters on um, those symmetrical or asymmetrical currents. This is all on a symmetrical current. So it's, um, they're all firing at the same time. They're not turning on and off. When one turns on, they're all turning on. And what I want him to work on here is finger extension with some elbow extension while he's reaching out. So he's doing a, like a decreased gravity activity by moving um, his socks into his laundry basket after we folded them. I'll go ahead and play the video now. And again, if I could do this, I'd probably turn that right him down on the shoulder it. a little bit because I, I feel like it's causing him to have too much of a shoulder hike. Um, yeah. But he just had poor awareness and poor strength in that hand, so 
that stem is helping get that full control of that finger extension as he's opening to let go. Play it a little bit longer here. Because I didn't have him reaching how this is different versus the activity I had this as the same gentleman that was doing the grooming bag activity on the previous slide. And I said the grooming activity was too difficult for him in sitting because I had him moving the items on the table. I could have certainly moved that grooming bag to the lower surface, kind of where the, the laundry basket is, but working on grooming items in and out of a bag made more sense in standing anyways. You wouldn't normally put your grooming items on the floor or the, your grooming bag on the floor, but for laundry, it makes sense. You would move, probably move your laundry from a table or from a couch to a laundry basket that's on a lower surface. So it made sense for us to do this activity in sitting and move, move our basket down to kind of accommodate for that arm weakness. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back to Nicole. All right, so we've been talking about upper extremity task oriented training tasks. Let's go ahead and switch down to talking about lower extremity activities. Um, lower extremity task specific training, task specific training pertains to the use of the hemiparatic limb for functional situations. Uh, this is most commonly accomplished during gait. Uh, which automatically provides those high level of repetitions. Um, you would apply the e-stem to stimulate the necessary muscle groups uh, to, in order to obtain the desired response for gait, such as um, increased hip extension or quad activation or uh, foot clearance for the dorsiflexors. To incorporate functional tasks, the person can do several... I, activities and just I mean the sky's limit just with upper extremities we're just now incorporating this into lower extremities um, perhaps the person is you know pushing a shopping cart and if you really want to go uh, overboard you can go ahead and have them reaching so you can incorporate both upper extremity and lower extremity tasks placing things into that shopping cart while they're pushing it um, we have had um, parents that are, have been here use a push a stroller um, and we'll put some weights in that stroller just to simulate maybe the weight of the baby um, and then they can also practice taking you know the simulated baby in and out of the uh, stroller which also then would target their um, balance activities um, you can, if you're not ready to work on gait tasks, you could, you could pare it down and work on simple uh, transfer activities such as a set to stand task. Um, you could do that from different uh, surfaces, maybe, uh, you know, a, a couch or a bed um, that simulates their, their typical home environment that they're going to have to be doing when, when they go home. Um, the therapist uh, should go ahead and try to time the e-stem uh, to the desired motion and again um, so when you want to activate the quads and the hip extensors for standing up or the hip flexors and the hamstrings for that eccentric control when you're sitting down uh, if you want to do more balance type tasks you could practice obstacle courses to challenge their balance while also still using the e-stem to target those same muscle groups that you would do just when you're walking. Um, and of course, stairs are a very functional activity, um, which as we know, will retrain muscle groups in a, both an open and a closed chain environment. So here we're gonna take a look at um, a gentleman who's doing some e-stem for gait activities. And uh, in this video, these videos, the, um, the therapist is actually using that trigger device that Sam mentioned earlier um, to, to trigger the dorsiflexors when she uh, wanted to help with that foot clearance. So in the first video, we can see not doing the e-stem yet, even though the leaf is on, she's not triggering it. He can get his foot through um, a little Difficulty controlling oh, that control, knee, though. little inversion is noted um, without the e stem target, you know, firing uh, for those dorsiflexors. So that was a very yeah. short video. Right. Hopefully, you're able to catch that. So, go. this video, she's firing the e stem, and you can see that's much better foot clearance 
kill strike. We, we still have there. some knee control issues, but you can see that his foot was coming through much um, easier uh, and the stability at the ankle was much better. But so just a quick comparison again. There's the first video without the stem. Oh, less control though. And then here is with the stem. She's firing it on right for the dorsiflexors there. There we go. Another um, task-oriented training task uh, activity that we use frequently, of course, is the FES bike for rhythmic cycling. Um, cycling activities have been shown to be therapeutic um, for stroke recovery, uh, including uh, benefits for cardiovascular endurance, strength, and coordination. Uh, research from COP ETAL uh, demonstrated a positive correlation between upper body cycling and increased uh, gait mechanics. Um, they hypothesized this was most likely secondary um, to the mechanics, improving the mechanics involved with reciprocal arm swing that we need for that smooth gait pattern. Um, if It was an interesting article. If you want to look more in detail, it is listed on our, our reference page. Um, the FES bike uh, that we did talk about earlier in the presentation um, combines therapeutic cycling with the e-stem. Um, this allows for activation of muscles that are affected by the stroke in coordination with uh, repetitive rhythmic movements, which as we learned um, when we're looking for those high repetition activities, uh, rhythmic cycling is going to really help target that and hit all those muscle groups for all the action of that cycling activity. Okay, this is Sam jumping back in again. I'm gonna talk now about how we use somatosensory stim um, for um, functional tasks. And just as a reminder for somatosensory stim, we're gonna talk about how we use that for mirror therapy and for gait. Um, so by definition, somatosensory stim is a lower level continuous sensory input. Um, so there's no on and off cycle. There's no, it's not symmetrical or asymmetrical. It's just a continuous sensory um, input with those longer pulse widths. Um, and you want to do this um, to a point where you have no muscle contraction, um, just to the point where they're feeling that muscle con or they're feeling that sense. So we'll talk briefly here about um, if you're doing sensory simulation, what kind of parameters you want to set. Um, this is a little bit less detail because you don't have um, as much going on um, with somatosensory stim. So for your amplitude, like I mentioned before, you want this to be below your motor threshold. So that means you're, you don't want to see a contraction. What I usually do is increase the amplitude until I see a motor contraction and then turn it down until it's no longer there as long as the patient can still feel it. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a variation there where they aren't feeling that sensory stim until there's a, a little bit of a, a muscle contraction going. So just kind of use this as a guide and, and then your own judgment for incorporating that part into your own clinical practice. Um, your pulse durations are one millisecond, really um, quick. Some handheld e-stem units don't even go that way that low. Um, so if you're considering getting a new device, you could um, put that on your, your check boxes of things is to see if your device can actually go that low. Um, if it doesn't, just turn it down as low as it will and, and, and use that. And your pulse frequency. Um, if you remember um, when we were talking about FES, we wanted our frequencies to be between 10 and 50 hertz um, because the, the more the higher the frequency you have, the more fast twitch muscle fibers that are recruited um, and you tire your muscle out, out quickly. So for somatosensory stem, when we have that stem on all the time and there's not an on off cycle moving, you wanna keep your frequency pretty low because you need your muscle to have um, good endurance to, to make it through the entire session. So we're going to talk again about how we use it for mirror therapy and gait, but other, other 
um, common uses for sensory stim, like we mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, are as well are for pain management, um, joint or musculoskeletal pain or neuropathic pain, um, and also for distraction or, or tension to the limb. I've used it both ways. I've used um, tens or sensory stim as a distraction to. Um, decrease awareness to that side if that side is um, causing a lot of pain or perseverations. And then you've had the opposite where someone doesn't attend to that side and you want to draw their attention to it. So you can use it for that as well. Again, use these um, suggestions as a guide and then, and then figure out how it makes best sense for you to use it in your practice. So mirror therapy. Um, We'll go do a brief overview of what mirror therapy is. Um, and mirror therapy is um, using movements of your stronger body part to trick your brain into thinking that the weaker body part is moving. So you're going to put your affected side in the box, your non-affected side on the outside. Hopefully that came across right. Um, so that way you're tricking your brain into thinking that you're seeing that affected arm move when you look in the mirror. Hope clear as mud. <laughs> um, so one way we use then the somatosensory stim in conjunction with the mirror box is when we use the mirror box, we always try to do some sort of functional activity, always, always, always on the outside. There, there is good research out there on protocols and exercises um, to use for the for mirror therapy, and you certainly can go to that. But when I'm first start working with someone, I usually just always try to do something functional. It just makes more sense for the brain, right? So what we're doing in, in these videos, these are going to be videos, is um, the person is using their right hand um, on the outside of their box. So this is their unaffected arm on the outside of the box. And she's just going to be working on picking up that, that squirt bottle, squeezing it, and then letting go and putting it back down. And all the while, she's watching herself do it in the mirror. These are really short videos, so what I want you to pay attention to is her left hand inside the box. In the first video, here, I'll go ahead and play it. Do stuff. The stim is not on. I just had those pads on, so there's no stim. And her hand is, is not moving. I'll go back and play it again after both of these videos go, but what I'll point out here, the hand inside the box is just, is just sitting there. There's poor awareness of that side. Um, and then I turn that sensory stim on just to the point where she can feel it. The, the pads are not giving her a muscle contraction, but what we start to notice is as she's doing the activity with her right hand, there's more movement with that left hand inside the box to try to do that activity with it. Um, so let's see here if I can go back and play that first video again. She's, as she's trying to do that functional activity, there's Minimal, move, minimal to no movement of that affected arm inside the box. And then the second video, as the stim is on, again, just to the point where she can feel it, the stim is not on for a motor response. There's no motor response, but she's demonstrating a motor response. That sensory stim is just helping increase that awareness to her hand to the point where she's now able to start to feel and kind of see what it would be like to move her hand as she's looking at it in the mirror. It's pretty cool. Um, if you guys try this in your clinic, our emails are on the on this presentation. I'd love to hear your stories about how it's worked for you. Um, this is another chart um, from Beekhausen article. I just put this up on here. Again, another um, piece of our presentation to pull out and kind of keep in your toolbox. A lot of these activities outside of the ones that are targeting the whole arm movement are really good activities to use with the mirror box when you're using that somatosensory stim um, on that affected arm. So I'll just kind of put it up here for a second, give you a chance to look at it. But um, again, I think this would be just a good one to kind of just print off and have as a reference of activities to do. All right, passing it back over to Nicole. Okay. Uh, so that sensory input training with the e-stim can also be used um, for gait training or anything in the lower extremities. In this, this particular situation, we are going to talk about um, gait. Uh, we're going to see two videos. Um, the first one is actually the video with the sensory stim on um, to help kind of bring some awareness uh, to this um, lady's left, or sorry, her right lower extremity. 
Um, it's hard to see in the video itself. Uh, she did have a Trendelenburg gait pattern. Um, so I believe the uh, therapist has um, some e-stim going through both the quads and then you can't really see it from here, but she does have it on the uh, glutes as well. Just real face. So, can, That's all right. so this is just with the stem on, just getting used to it, Good. bring some attention to that side. You can Watch see towards the end, she's kind of starting to speed it up. She says, yep, I'm feeling that. Wait, you want me to go? I got this. And then we took the e-stem off to see if there would be some carryover. And sure enough, she was able to keep that gate speed going. So that was kind of, it's kind of a neat task to, to use. Um, you're not really firing the muscles as such. Um, remember that you want to see the muscle contract and then turn the e-stem down to know that you're in that sensory mode. Uh, but it does really help uh, bring attention to those muscles at the right time. At this point in time, um, we're going to start wrapping up our presentation here. Uh, this is just a review of those uh, objectives that we listed at the beginning. I, I, we reviewed the general um, parameters of eSTEM and their uh, uses. We've identified um, applications um, to use it for stroke recovery, and we've identified at least three different options um, for both upper extremity and lower extremity training. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Sam, as well. Looks like we have a few minutes left for Q&A, and indeed, we do have a few questions that have been submitted, so let's jump right into it. To get us started, Let's go first to this question from Elizabeth. Can e-stim be used on a flaccid extremity or grade zero muscle strength? Uh, yes, yeah, it, it can be used um, on a flaccid arm. Um, at that point in time, you're probably going to be using the e-stim to elicit a contraction um, or to just simply bring awareness um, to that extremity, especially if the person demonstrates um, neglect to their affected side. I would say you as the therapist would be providing um, like hand over hand assist uh, to stimulate the desired movement. If you still wanted to incorporate a functional activity, even though they don't have any active movement in the extremity that you're using. All right, let's go next to Caitlin. This is a good question. Can family be trained to perform e-stim outside of therapy sessions? Okay, this is Sam. Um, yes, after um, training and being checked off on safely using and setting up the devices, we frequently have family members that will assist their loved ones with e-STEM activities outside of their ther therapy sessions just to give that carryover, and um, then we can target other things in our sessions as well. All right, for this next question, I'm going to pose it myself. I think some of our viewers might be wondering what the name of that handheld device is that you showed during your presentation. Can you tell us what the name of that device is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the little small handheld um, e-STEM device. Uh, it's known as the MP uh, device. Um, but as far as we know, this unit has actually been discontinued and is not available for purchase anymore. Um, so if you out there as clinicians have been using similar uh, portable e-STEM devices. We would actually love to hear from you from what you've been finding is successful. All right, let's see if we can squeeze one last question in. This one is from, let's go to this one from Arlene. Would you still consider doing e-STEM if someone is unable to feel the stimulation? Hi there, this is Sam. Um, some of the literature actually states to avoid using the e-STEM over areas of decreased sensation. However, I feel like as a clinician, you can consider this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, figure out what your goal is for using the yeast stem. Are you using it to promote sensory awareness, to el elicit that muscle response, and then determine if the parameters you need to achieve that goal are safe to use on that area. If um, the patient is cognitively intact and is able to 
to tell you, give you a pain, pain response. Um, you know, I think that's something to consider as well. All right. And I think that is just about all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much, Nicole. Before we wrap things up, a few final notes. Again, if you missed one of the earlier webinars in this series, all of them are available on the On With Life website. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no cost to view any of the webinars. And each webinar is good for one contact hour of continuing education credit. After you viewed a webinar, all you need to do is complete the post-webinar evaluation form and you'll receive your certificate. Thanks so much for being with us today. That does conclude today's webinar. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.